everyone. Welcome to episode number 81 of the Avocado Gamescast, your uncle's favorite gaming podcast. I'm Merv, and today we're going to talk about some recent happenings in the industry and what we've been playing lately. We're also bringing back, drumroll please, you can't actually hear me banging my desk, but let's assume you can, <laughs> the trivia challenge, which I don't think we've done since 2017. So Man. it's a throwback. Yeah. So while everyone else is testing their metal in Elden Ring, I'm going to force my guests to test their gaming smarts. My guess, they're going to want to beat the crap out of me by the end of this episode. However, while my skeleton and my very handsome face are still intact, <laughs> let's introduce the fine folks who are joining me today. He's rolled marbles with Yella and modeled footwear with Thor High Heels. It's Brasson. Good evening, Murph. Uh, glad to be here again. I'm going to lose a trivia, so that's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> He's solving crimes with Lieutenant Colombo and Ryonosuke Naruhodo. It's Wolfman Jew. Oh, and I have some thoughts on Elden Ring, but th that'll be for later. Absolutely. I almost said Lieutenant Colombo because I'm Canadian, and that would have been <laughs> kind of disastrous. <laughs> and finally, he can't hear you over the shrieks of the Witch Queen. It's the Kappa. Hey, I, and speaking about losing uh, at trivia, be prepared to really try to outlose me because I don't play any of the games <laughs> that everybody else plays. I tried to balance out the questions this time. Okay. They're a lot easier than the last one. Yeah, last time it was like Nintendo and indie stuff. I'm like, I don't know any of this, man. <laughs> there's some Nintendo stuff. There's some indie stuff in here. There's also like Xbox stuff, some retro stuff. Good. Okay. Browser gotta... games. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Uh, just honor. To, yeah, we're gonna to, be just to one about Ultima next time, Murph. It's gonna be <laughs> way better for me and Kappa. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, I don't know um, anything about Ultima. I'm sorry. I. I... What were you going to say? I said I mostly know about it in its relationship to Japanese RPGs. Yeah, it is a very influential series of games. So, you know, it's probably something I should look into at some point in my life, but there are it's, only it's, so many hours in the day. Yeah, and it's really hard to go back. I even tried to go back lately and replay um, Baldur's Gate, the enhanced one, and I forget like, how slow maybe like the first two hours of that game really are and almost all those games of its type when you've played the modern trpg revivals they get you right into it you know um and baldur's gate is a really weird feel to kind of try to jump back into um so yeah it's it, it's weird the pacing i think of a lot of those older rpgs i think that's where it lose you right away yeah absolutely it's it's so hard to go back to older games when you're so used to all the quality of life changes that have mm -hmm. happened in more recent games mm -hmm. and like um, uh, sorry you were going to say something? I, I think that's sometimes true. I think there's also a lot of games that kind of man do manage to thread that really well. Yeah, and, um, and so, some, sometimes I think too with the first, you know, let's say a couple hours, the issue is like maybe they're teaching you something that like by now has become so common that like it's it feels weird in a tutorial or like a story that's so slow because it really got to get you to those intro stages that you don't feel like a part of the story you feel like part of a you know a prequel to the story which doesn't always get you going in an RPG right uh, to be fair that's also true of a lot of modern RPGs uh, yeah. I do think that's kind of true of say Dragon Quest 11 yeah but yeah stuff I like think... Dragon Age Wasteland like a lot of the modern revivals that have taken off of another series they get you right into it like you're you're fighting out of the gates it's not go to the innkeeper and talk about his rat problem you know which is now yeah like say Dragon Age Origins starts off mm -hmm. really slow mm -hmm. um Dragon Age Inquisition gets you right into it and yep, those that's are a not good that far example apart. between those three yeah uh but like um you know, if I go back and play Origins, there's stuff about it that I appreciate that I wish had been an in Inquisition. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, you know, the there's this trade-off. alone are fantastic. I mean, that's such a cool intro, you know, to get that difference right from the gate for how you play. Yeah, those differences in Origins. Yeah. Um, so, normally when I set the agenda for this podcast, I do have a topic in mind. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's usually based on what other people want to talk about. Apparently, in our case, it's old school RPGs. <laughs> Today, we're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> 81 episodes in, I am finally going to be a selfish jerk 
and we're yeah. going to talk about what I want to talk about today. That's right. We're doing Soul Hackers 2, Digimon <laughs> Con, Xenoblade Chronicles 3. It's the Murph cast now, suckers. Woo! Um, yeah, in all seriousness, there have been actually a lot of interesting happenings in the industry lately. Apparently, February is the big month for news now. Who knew? Uh, February alone has been a monster for releases. I, I mean, it is insane. I, mean, I, I think there's a big, a good reason for that, which is that. <coughs> sorry, um, I think there's a good reason for that, which is that like that's coming up close on when companies have to release their annual reports. Oh yeah. So like that's why you you know in the worst case you have something like Mass Effect Andromeda coming out in March because they, they just, just had to. Get... to. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting now that it's also where they're announcing this news. I suppose it's for end of the year financials as well. You know, goose the yeah. stock price before um, you have to put out the annual report. Um, but like, it's it does make for a little bit of a weird uh, kind of shape to the hype cycle, if you will. Yeah, I wonder uh, too. I'm not I complaining. Mean, like, More news. Yeah, right? it, Fe February has traditionally been like a dumping ground for mm -hmm. like movies. You know, it's like when they just, you know, get stuff out and who cares? It's, it's not going to be good. We don't care. It's your uncharted of the world. But um, I wonder if that's the response has been for Game Okay, well, now this is an actual release time for us because we don't have the competition that we might have with like an MCU or something. I think that just like the weird, maybe one weird result of how obsessively big the holiday season gets is that basically every season that's not the holiday season is kind of kind of like prime ground mm -hmm. and we even talked this year it was kind of a slow november and then february is like a yeah like it seems like a game a week is coming out that i want to play yeah but i still think it's also a bit of outwashes from covid like a lot yeah. of games oh, yeah. uh, delay delayed a lot a lot of nintendo stuff got like delayed forever yeah but even more for indie stuff and it feels now like uh, stuffing is open again people can meet again uh, finally can fine tune their projects and they can release them now. The, it's it's very likely that almost every single thing, and then we'll get to it when we get to it later, but it's very likely that almost every single thing in the Nintendo Direct was actually intended to release even up a year, maybe even two years earlier. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably put, the, the only thing in there that I'd probably put as releasing on time is Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Because that thing probably mm -hmm. had to cook for a while, but yeah, there's no way that um, like they probably want that Mario Strikers game out way earlier would be my guess. Yeah, yeah, Kirby one also. It feels yeah. like a release for the Switch in year two, and yeah. it just yeah, got like sure. endlessly uh, delayed. All right, so we're gonna start with something that happened last night, and this is not interesting from the perspective of the actual like announcements it's interesting more from like a business perspective what happened last night with digimon con um which we're only talking about because i'm you know the avocado's <laughs> resident digimon fanboy and we have to talk about it um so as i'm sure most of you are aware digimon survive which was announced way back in 2018 originally scheduled for 2019 every year has been pushed back last night it was announced that production was moved from a studio in japan called witchcraft to a slightly bigger studio called Hyde, uh, which is known mostly for their outsourcing and white label work. They've made a few games of their own, uh, like Disney Tim Tim Festival and a couple of other games like that, but they're really not known as um, like a you know, AAA or even AA developer. Um, so this has been really weird. This game has been in production for so long. It was originally supposed to be a stopgap game between major Digimon game releases. And now it's been delayed by potentially into 2023 from an original 2019 release date. This is a mess. <laughs> right? Yeah. And you kind of have to wonder, like, how much of this is the fact that we're all we're still in a chaotic and co like COVID situation with no real easy exit point and how much of it is other things, too. Yeah, it seems like it was a combination with Witchcraft. They have a fairly small staff, probably couldn't deal very well with COVID. And on top of that, they just couldn't make a game that met Bandai's quality standards. Um, 
I'm really hoping for a tell-all about this game's development. Like, <laughs> whoever the Japanese Jason Schreier is, please get on this, because I'm yeah, sure it's going to be fascinating. That's the problem with Japan. This stuff doesn't leak easily. Like, uh, the last one I remember was that, like, non-Mega Man, Mega Man game. But it had, like, a lot of uh, British and uh, American staff working on it, and that's why so much leaked about it. For the rest, yeah, it's was nearly nothing like in Japan. Yeah, Mighty yeah. Number 9. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a, that was a good old-fashioned mess. That was, that was interesting to read about. Yeah, it was... Originally, I got really actually really confused with this because there are two studios named Witchcraft, one based in Poland and one based in Tokyo. Mm. And uh, if you search for Witchcraft Studio, you first get the Polish <laughs> one in search results. Yeah, and they both work on like mobile and double A development and mm. like, handheld stuff. So it's actually super confusing. <laughs> yeah, the difference between Monolith and Monolith Soft. Oh yeah, that's also confusing. We should. There's so many names for things out there. We should just like hold a contest to see who gets to keep the name, <laughs> especially for Monolith. Were you yeah. sure that um, Digimon are still the champions, or are they not the champions still? Or I don't know. <laughs> I like I am like they had all this anime announcement stuff, and I'm just like, eh, I don't really care about this I anymore. Haven't... That's all I remember is the is the theme song for the cartoon. Did you guys not have the theme song for the cartoon? Oh in yeah, Canada, or... I remember. Okay. <laughs> no, we had no. The only anime that had a different uh, theme song up here was Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know why there's a Canadian exclusive theme song for that anime. It That's never made sense to me. What was it? Yeah. Because you guys had something like Dragon, Dragon, Rock the Dragon. We just had like Dragon, Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't it remember weird. it being very like stirring. It was kind of just like I don't know. I I probably watched the old version because I'm old, but I remember Dragon Ball Z almost just being kind of like like a butt rock intro. Yeah. But I don't remember what else was was there to it. We also had butt rock, but it was different butt rock. <laughs> we had homegrown butt rock. It's like <laughs> you folks had uh, I don't know um, Temple of the Dog, and we had Theory of a Dead Man. <laughs> Temple of the Dog is good. I don't know why I'm railing on. Right oh, now. how dare you! You're about to start a fight. Yeah, I'm about to go on yeah, a hunger but strike. Speaking of the area, it wouldn't be like Sorry. Nickelback. More yeah, a better option. <laughs> Nickelback. I, I was trying to pick like the worst Canadian butt rock band I could think of, um, and that's got to be Theory of a Dead Man, right? That's the band David Cage. Shine Down. They feel. Are they Canadian? No, Shine Down's American. Okay, Shine Down's very American. Okay. Yeah. No, Theory of a Dead Man is like David Cage's favorite band. That's why they're oh, all man. over Fahrenheit. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was Digimon Con. Um, I guess the other announcement, very self uh, indulgently, that I wanted to mention was Soul Hackers 2, which is a game of the Mega Ten franchise that is not Shin Megami Tensei or Persona. We're finally getting like a big game that is not one of those two and is not Tokyo Mirage Sessions. So Or Catherine. Or Catherine, which is made by Atlas, but isn't really in the wider Mega Ten verse. Uh, but yeah, it's a new game from them by the same people who made Tokyo Mirage Sessions, that same lead. But it's cyberpunky and weird and is basically Persona for Grown Ups, so I'm psyched for that. Yeah, I've I've lost I've lost the thread on personas. I I I don't know. There's a fighting game. I know that. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been that. playing it. It's it's fun, but it's also like 50 hours, and I had problems uh, finishing less persona already. So yeah, yeah. I I the people who love it are are still totally on board. With, you know, like like with lots of games, but I think Persona maybe needs to have that one draw game you know it brings new people into the franchise it feels daunting I mean, it, to get it, into i mean that, they did that was persona 5 yeah for yeah, sure that's i West think five. it's just i think yeah. maybe what kaba means here is that it's the games are daunting in a sense that they're so huge yeah they're long it's a yeah. time commitment i'm yeah. hoping soul hackers 2 just like halves the running time and that would still make it a 50 hour rpg which i think is fine you just don't want to be playing that game for 120 hours. Yeah, 120 hours is a hard ass to get it as an entrance point to a series. You know, I think Nintendo's been really smart, especially about maybe doing this a little bit lately with kind of like entry points. Um, oh, yeah. You know, like and Tokyo Mirage Sessions, that is a 50 hour yeah. game. 
as opposed to yeah. a hundred hour game. Yeah, but even even their fighting game Kickers, which is like a really good beat 'em up uh, slide strategy game, it's like 50, 60 hours. I'm oh, the way through. Yeah, you know, Strikers. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah you, you said Mario Kickers, and I got confused. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll, yeah, but it's like it's way too long for a game like that, and there's like endless cutscenes. Mm-hmm. And I enjoy the cutscenes, but I'm also like I'm not playing Persona Five. Just hurry up a bit. Yeah, I liked that game, but I turned the difficulty all the way down to easy because I just wanted to blast through it. I was like, I can't spend eighty hours on this. So if you turn the difficulty down to easy, it really speeds things up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, uh, you yeah. know. Can you change the difficulty midway through the game? I, I remember it's telling me that you couldn't in Persona 5. Persona 5, you can't. In Strikers, you can. You can change the okay. difficulty whenever you want. Oh, yeah. Well, with Strikers, that's also, like, that's different because Strikers just has gameplay that basically desperately needs to have, a, like, a short story and a broad everything else. Oh, no, the story in that game is long. <laughs> the story oh, yeah. is longer than Persona 5, no joke. That's a lot, because um, I'm thinking from my like perspective as like the archetypal Muso crossover being Hyrule Warriors, which has a fairly short story, and it's a game that I still spend hundreds of hours on because the majority of like the game's content is through all the, this really cool collection of extra modes, and like if you want to just play and hit the credits, it's actually it's not too difficult, but damn. A Muso game being longer than the long JRPG on which it is based is. Yeah, wow. it's a like the game is shorter overall, but that's because the combat and exploration are a lot shorter, and there is actually a lot of exploration in this game. Yes. Like you go a long time between battle sequences. It's. Yeah, I, I was timing like a while back. I'm like halfway between the games, and I had like a period where it was like Jakusa lengths between fights. It was like. 40 minutes or something just cutscenes exploration cutscenes yeah there are some evenings where i played it where i didn't actually engage in combat i was just like going around exploring going through cutscenes buying stuff doing weird side questy things yeah it's purely a muso game but speaking of muso games Mm. at the nintendo direct which happened a couple of weeks ago now uh, yeah. A new Muso spinoff was announced for Fire Emblem, Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes, which I, I guess they've already done a Fire Emblem Muso, but this is a new Fire yes. Emblem Muso. Um, so this Fire Emblem Warriors was basically like uh, the next, uh, like the next kind of was sort of the natural extension of Hyrule Warriors, which is just going from a Zelda Muso game to now a Fire Emblem Muso game in the in the like weird lineage of like modern very odd nintendo crossovers yeah um i was not as much of a fan of it for a few reasons i thought it was a little bit more difficult i felt that the balancing was much more of an issue and it basically hyrule warriors and as far as i can tell most muso games they're very just like cheap and low power fantasies and the success of Hyrule Warriors, and I assume the success of uh, the other better Musou games, is that they're basically able to really kind of capture that. And in the interest of kind of exploring high, like sort of Fire Emblem esque tactical mechanics, the game was tr- designed to be more tactical. Which, although that was also stuff that they added in the 3DS port of Hyrule Warriors, because yeah, th- there was a 3DS port of Hyrule Warriors and a 3DS port of Fire Emblem Warriors. How did that? game run on 3ds not well yeah that's what i would assume um uh, so more broadly about the direct uh, i'm gonna be honest and as, as someone who's been kind of a little bit nintendo like hot and cold on nintendo over the years this is honestly the first time i've felt excited about nintendo since the year of the switch release um so like you know i'm pumped for kirby and the forgotten land Really excited for Xenoblade Chronicles 3. There was some stuff with the J- Japan version of the Direct that was announced that was super interesting looking. Um, the thing that's getting the most memes, though, is Mouthful Mode in <laughs> yeah. Kirby of the Forgotten Land, which just looks like the... F- 
I don't know. It's absolutely demented and deranged, but I love it. Yeah. I, I just I just hope there will be an Easter egg where you can um, just like ingest a pinball table and, and you can play like Kirby pinball. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 I wholly assume that this is basically going to be the equivalent of like Cappy from Mario Odyssey and basically every transformation is just going to have increasingly bizarre abilities and mechanics, some of whom will probably just be an entirely new mini game. Oh, it yeah. would be great. I loved uh, the Cappy mechanic. It was like the most fun I had in a Mario game in like forever. It, this looks like Super Mario 3D World, but with Super Mario Odyssey mechanics. And yeah. Kirby trappings, which I'm down for. It looks, it's yeah. the most excited I've been about a Nintendo game in years. So, uh, I, this is a somewhat hot takey perspective from my part and i say this as someone who is a big kirby fan yeah is that i think the series really just was never able to fully come back after masahiro sakurai left hell like it's not to say that there aren't good kirby games since then amazing kirby and amazing mirror is excellent it's a fantastic game it's one of the it stands tall with the ones sakurai made but it does feel like ever since then every success of kirby almost not every successive Kirby game, because the more weird ones like Epic Yarn and Canvas Curse are very different. But like Return to Dreamland, Triple Deluxe, Star Allies, or Squeak Squad are all like very aggressive, like iteration and very light iterations on that basic like core structure that Nightmare and Dreamland and or sorry that Dream that Dreamland and Kirby's Adventure and Kirby Superstar did. And uh, my problem with Star Allies, and I've just I've only played the demo, is that it felt like a game that didn't need me to be there. Yes. That makes any sense? It's... Like obviously you have to move your character around and if you don't do anything you will die. But I felt like whatever buttons I pressed, as long as I pressed some button yeah. so I won. it's 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 <laughs> like those Yoshi games pretty much. Like yeah. uh, yarn. Yeah. Uh, well, Yoshi's Ep- well, Yoshi's Woolly World did eventually become like grotesquely challenging after a point. <laughs> um, but yeah, the um, basically the mechan- the main structure in like a standard Kirby game is basically you know it's like a Mario three esque map where you kind of walk around and choose the next level and. It's fairly standard. The difficulty curve is always very low and ramps up only a little bit. But um, typically, instead of kind of changing that or altering it or moving away from it, a lot of the standard Kirby games will essentially do the same thing except have one mechanical difference. Um, in, in Planet Robobot, it's the robot. In Star Allies, it's the the like four-player co-op. And basically... The quality of the difference is ultimately the only thing that really kind of makes the games better or worse. And in Star Allies, the problem is that it's designed for co-op all the time. So if you play by yourself, it's not, it's like the enemies are just way too tough. But if you play with everyone else, then it doesn't really ever feel like you're that contributive of a member. And that's especially a problem when you're, can't play by when you have to play by yourself and then use computer characters who just like do whatever the hell they want. Yeah, it really just feels like it's how do I put this. That game feels like there's no room for doing anything experimental or interesting. Like, yeah, you don't you know exactly what you need to do when you meet an enemy. And then you just do that thing. It's very rote, very rigid for a game where you feels like you should be able to experiment a bit and try different strategies. It doesn't. This is. Um, I also think that part of it is that the, I do think the level design has actually gotten worse since those like yeah. the high points of the series. Like Superstar is really good about basically like providing options and increasing the difficulty and kind of pushing you into trying new stuff and like it and. You know, then you have games like 64, which were just all about experimentation because you have to mix and match powers. And then you have the bit. I do think that because of how like of rigid the traditional Kirby structure is, the innovation you usually see is in like the very weird spin-off stuff. 
Yeah, and this is why I'm excited for this upcoming 3D Kirby game, because it feels like it's finally going to get back some of that weird, anarchic, experimental spirit that I just kind of associate with Kirby as a character. Yeah. And uh, that's what I'd like to see going forward. But... Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised I haven't played Kirby in a long time. I, that's what I thought it still was, hearing that it's kind of gotten away from that is, yeah, that that's what I thought the core of the whole character was. Yeah, I think you'll actually, if you like these kinds of platforms, I think this might be the game that brings you back to Kirby. I don't no. know. We'll see how that comes out. Um, a couple of other games that I did want to mention, Xenoblade Chronicles 3, I think it's going to be very niche for the people who were into the first two Xenoblade Chronicles, i.e. me. Um, <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, no, I like Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I don't like the first Xenoblade Chronicles. Don't tell anyone. Um, but it seems like it looks, you know, like Xenoblade Chronicles 2, similar art style. Uh, fair vehicles now, apparently. The character designs don't look embarrassing, which is nice. But I don't really know what else to say about it. it in that case, it's a synthesis of, like, maybe it look, the tone feels Xenoblade 1 esque, the, like, art style is Xenoblade 2 esque, the vehicles are kind of from Xenoblade X. Yeah. X. Uh, yeah, it seems like they've kind of integrated all three of those, which I, I don't know. I'm excited for that. I'll see how it is come this fall, but um, yeah, it's it. Monolith, I think, is kind of Nintendo's secret weapon in terms of being able to do stuff that no other studio can do. Yeah, no other studio can make games that feel this expansive, and I wish that they could kind of shore up their like the technical side of things because their games often mm. don't run that well. Um, but in terms of what they create and the scope of what they create, they're pretty much un unparalleled. Yeah. So uh, what, what else did you f folks find interesting from um, that I presentation? Am, well, for one thing, I actually am cautiously optimistic for Fire Emblem. Uh, I Like I said, fine, I kind of got burned out. I didn't like Fire Emblem Warriors. They didn't like the next Nintendo Musou game, Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. But Three Houses does happen to have one of the best casts of any video game. So making a Musou out of them feels just like, it feels like a very natural thing to do, but also yeah. very exciting because of that. Like, um, it, I, I think... You know, I actually don't think I was on here since I've mentioned that Fire Emblem Three Houses is my favorite game of 2019. And it was a lot of people's favorite game of 2019. That yeah. game was up, like that game's still in my backlog. I bought it and never played it. <laughs> <laughs> so I should probably get around to that. I'm busy with Breath of the Wild, which I yeah. still haven't beaten. Um, there's some other interesting stuff there, like this new so, Nintendo Switch sports game. Yeah. Like a sequel uh, to Wii Sports, which could yeah, be neat. That's, it's like been over fifteen. It's been like over fifteen years, but it's really cool to have a successor to Wii Sports. Apparently, Chambara is really fun. I'm glad to hear it. I I didn't actually play the original Wii Sports. Um, oh, Murph, it's so much fun. I yeah, played fun. <laughs> one of the games, and I was really, really bad at it. Is it was at a friend's <laughs> birthday party? Uh, gosh. How long ago? I was back in undergrad. Oh, God. Yeah, I was at a friend's Wii, and then we played that, like, mini game, and then we all went out to a bar to play pool. That's what I associate <laughs> Wii Sports with in my head, the one time I played it. Um, it feels absurd that it's taken so long for Nintendo to do a follow-up to it. They yeah. kind of did. You had all those instant games and the other ones and stuff. There was still some stuff coming out on the Wii U, but it yeah. wasn't like uh, it wasn't just sports. It was like lesser activities, pretty much. Yeah, like kayak, yeah. like canoeing, I believe. Yeah, and bungee jumping, and you can go like gliding yeah. and stuff like that. I played a few of them on the Wii U. They're also quite good, yeah. but never uh, it's like so laser focused as the original Wii Sport. So I, here's my hot take on this. I think I, th I think for the most part, um, motion control implementations for a lot of this stuff, like for instance, Mario Tennis Aces, are just god awful. Except for when <laughs> Nintendo like 
goes really, really hard on like a motion control of the game. So your your Wii Sports, uh, your Ring Fit Adventure, where the motion controls work super duper well. So I'm hoping this is more like one of their really, really strong efforts and not like Camelot tossing in another garbage motion control mode well, into one of their uh, it's, it's It's a former headliner game. It's like the game everybody knows from the Wii. So, so they yeah, better do this right. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I also think that part of the difference is that it's Nintendo's internal team making it who've had, like, a lot of experience making these kinds of games versus Camelot, who, like, who, who it's always been more secondary. Yeah. It's not that it wasn't there. And, and to bounce off of you, what you said, Merv, I mean, I think, to me, the long-forgotten now, Connect. I think kind of had a similar story, right? If a game was designed with it in mind and Microsoft put the funding or the tech behind it, yeah, some Kinect games felt really cool. It felt really yeah, cool and integrated. Through. And then, you know, everybody else was like, well, you, yeah. you can give a voice command or something really stupid <laughs> like that. Like, oh, yeah, like the... there's, there's like that mech game, right? That's right. like yeah. insane. Yeah, oh, yeah, Steel Battalion Heavy Armor? It's... Oh, yeah, that was <laughs> yeah, a train it's, wreck. It's insane to see in action. Or a mech wreck, if you will. Um, yeah. <laughs> then there was uh, that. Didn't um, Binary Domain have Connect integration? Yeah. Like you would shout commands but the yes. voice detection is really really bad so it's a microphone on the other saying. end of your room most yeah. likely yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it really depends on whether like i'm a motion control skeptic for the most part mm -hmm. but when it's done well like i own ring fit and it's fantastic yeah. Yeah. but mm -hmm. any other time i have to deal with motion controls i'm just like why uh, yeah i think I'm... you'll probably like the ones in Wii Sports because it's typically yeah. designed with them first instead of the motion controls. I think the motion controls in a lot of their other games are treated as secondary since they kind of recognize that a lot of players will will want the option. But yeah. with Wii Sports, you kind of have to play it with the motion controls. I'm sure there... I actually don't know. I think they'll probably have, like, a non-motion-controlled option that'll be very token. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the word around that time, especially with Wii, was waggle. Remember, everybody, everything was waggle, right? Oh, and then, yeah. like, Wii Sports was the first game where it didn't feel like waggle your controller like crazy to make something happen. Wii Sports was very much like, if you do this movement, your character will do this movement, and it feels like you're controlling it, not except, fighting except against except it. Except in boxing, and boxing was like waggling yeah. the shit out of it. <laughs> yeah. With a nunchuck, so it sense. was like the worst Throw game ever. the room. <laughs> yeah. Boxing was the most, was the worst, and it was also the most embarrassing to watch someone play. Yeah. Um, I actually, think no, they kind of like apologized for that by making arms. Yeah, but bowling <laughs> yeah. was fantastic. I mean, like, I play Wii Bowling to this day all day. I, I really enjoyed it. But, you know, I think that was that was the thing. Like, it felt like, okay, well, I can actually control games with this thing. It's not all just waggle my arms and look look foolish, you know. So um, I, I'd actually play Wii Sports right now if, when it, if and when it comes out, if it's any good. So maybe um, the only – I think I was only excited for two things from the show, and that was one of them. Chrono Cross was the other, so. Oh, yeah, they're I'm, remastered I'm very, Chrono Cross. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm very excited about the uh, Ciento case also. Because I really like FMV games for some yeah. Oh, yeah, reason. the Centennial case. Yeah. So uh, let's do let's talk about Chrono Cross, and then we'll talk about Centennial case. I have no reference point for Chrono Trigger or Chrono Cross because I didn't grow mm -hmm. up with them. But this was rumored for a really long time, and it finally got announced, and a lot of people are very happy about this. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the I, I I'm hoping that the tech has improved just a little bit. Um, you know, Chrono Cross. I don't know why. I just had this feeling, at least from when I played it, it felt a little bit of a game that was pushing the limits of the system it was on in a yes. lot of weird ways. Um, and then like, I think a lot of the ports, for whatever reason, didn't really show it much love and kind of were more direct ports. Maybe the, it's, it's um... just. Yeah, it's just emulator ports or yeah. far, pretty much. They're yeah. fine, but uh, it's like one of my favorite games. It's uh, like one of the few RPGs I really, really like. Mm -hmm. But all the ports have been like fine so far. They're playable, but yeah. The um, the DS port of Chrono Trigger was very good. That's yes. actually how I played the game. Um, but yeah, um, typically the reason, at least in Trigger's case, is that when they made Chrono Cross, Square decided to re-release Chrono Trigger so fans of Cross could play it. 
Um, but their emulation was basically terrible and apparently nigh unplayable, but it's the PlayStation version that they decided was easiest to port. And so that's the one that's kind of become the standard for like their PC version and the apparently very bad mobile version. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually feels kind of like the situation, <coughs> uh, sorry, it feels kind of like the situation much more recently where Square did the same thing where they re-released the entire Kingdom Hearts series on Switch, yes. but specifically only the cloud version because they felt it would be too expensive and too time-consuming to make a version of those games that could run on Switch, and so instead they just used the uh, they just used the um, the Steam port or the PC version. That's so, apparently very bad. So effectively, what they did um, is like the ports of the old Kingdom Hearts games are effectively running in a PS2 emulator. Mm, yeah. So, and that's what's running on like your PS4 in those collections, and then effectively it's also what's running in the PC version. So, um, like a PS4 or a PC are powerful enough to run a Switch emulator properly. Sorry, a PS2 emulator properly, but a Switch is not. If you yes. were to port those natively onto Switch, they would probably run at 60 FPS, no problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I was also wondering, they are like porting No Man's Sky, and I know Witcher 3 has a pretty okay port on Switch. It's yeah. not great, but it runs like at 30, it's fine. But like No Man's Sky is like, <laughs> even on my PS4, it's like nearly destroying uh, my console because it's like so much calculating so much power pretty much uh with the worlds it takes forever to load still it's a very fun game but i can't see it uh, run on the switch except for like a completely like uh st stripped down version it's crazy that we're even talking about no man's sky in 2022 to be honest with you i mean that's yeah. i thought yes. the game was Talk about a comeback dead. Yeah. yeah, it's it's very good now. Yeah, it's yeah, I've been good. playing it on PC every now and then. Yeah, um, you know, I, I usually have. You know, I've talked about this before on the podcast. I like have games that I install if I'm in a mood for, it, and it's always been elite for me if I want to, you know, go hop on Galaxy and you know explore the universe, or whatever. But lately, it has been No Man's Sky, um, and I actually kind of really enjoy the direction it's gone. But um, yeah, Chrono Cross is a fun, is one of my favorite RPGs. I kind of given up on seeing a, a decent port, to be honest. Um, there's so many issues with the other ports. I mean, it's not just like graphics and, and, and things like that, or like art style. Uh, it's frame rate. It's real, it's real chunky to play. It feels an antiquated in a lot of ways. So um, I'm glad to see it's getting an actual full on sounds like remaster now. I still want to see it in action, you know. Yeah, but, for sure. Uh, some of the little uh, previews they gave, it was a little clunky looking. So I'm hoping that that was just a, you know, early version jitters or something. But uh, Chrono Cross is, I think it's going to be interesting to kind of see that come back up, not just for the the technical aspects, but for the plot and story and stuff for people who haven't experienced it before. Um, it's a game that I think would be cool to come back around and kind of like the the discourse, if you will. Um, yeah because I, I really enjoyed it a lot. And it, in a lot of ways, it kind of feels like the lost great game for somehow, like, you know, that weird, you know, kind of oxymoron of like, how do you, you know, forget about a great game? It feels like Chrono Cross might be like one of those few where that actually applies. Yeah, because everyone loves Trigger so much. People don't mm -hmm. talk about Cross anywhere near as much with, or right. as much affection. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out when it ever it releases. Um, and Brasson mentioned earlier the centennial case of Shijima story, which was only in the Japanese version of the Direct, but is also coming to the West with English subtitles. So this is really interesting to me. It's developed by hand, H-A-N-D, mm -hmm. with periods between the letters, that has never made an FMV game before, and it's being published by Square Enix. Mm. <laughs> This is uh, yes, weird it's, to me. It's good for them. <laughs> but but it looks good. It's it looks like a lot of fun. It looks yeah, fantastic. I've, I've, yeah, I've been playing a, a bunch of the Tex Murky games uh, recently. Mm. They all been like put on yeah. Steam and Gork. They're a lot of fun, but they're also pretty clunky. Yeah, <laughs> they are. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's. But I really like everything games. They're like a niche game for sure. But even like in 2022. There's for sure a market for them, and they can be done, done extremely well. Yeah. Just look at like telling lies and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. 
this looks like it has elements of those Sam Barlow games in terms of how you rewind and fast forward through the yes. footage to scrub for clues. But then they've layered like the live action remake of Root Letter on top of it. <laughs> so it, I don't know how that's going to turn out. It seems like they would have had to also have filmed so much footage to make this happen. So hopefully it's good. We'll see yeah. how it turns out. Um, so that was the direct. A couple of other things that were announced recently. Um, we finally got gameplay footage of the Dune Spice Wars 4X mm -hmm. game that was announced at E... Not E3, sorry, the Game Awards last year. Game Awards, yep. So how does that look? I uh, haven't really followed it. Uh, so what's kind of like the op the opposite of cautiously optimistic <laughs> um, <laughs> um, excitedly cautiously pessimistic, pessimistic. <laughs> yeah um it looks clunky uh I i'm kind of shocked that they you know i heard it was going to be 4x so you know i can live with that but i'd assume that some kind of combo of 4x and rts would mean you'd be playing the battles kind of on like a different map if that makes sense um you know there's a lot of games that do that right you're doing a 4x but then when the, the battle comes down you kind of condense and then you fight an actual battle screen on a battle um this doesn't seem to be doing that which to me I, I don't know that's a weird direction to take the series in it looks way more civ um yeah. than i was expecting and it looks like almost like a real-time civ game which is a hard spot for me to kind of envision gameplay gameplay wise what that feels like right it looks um, almost age of empires -y. Mm -hmm. but but like you see these little t well they're not tiny they're giant units you know marching towards each other um <laughs> you know and the combat seems really unimpressive to me so far uh they're just kind of sitting there you know punching each other or whatever um it, it doesn't really have that that pull that i was expecting to to really want to see i don't know um it 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 didn't really do it for me um at least, you know, I, I actually thought originally what I was reading or talking about was a leak because everything seemed like, okay, this is, you know, some, something along these lines is what we're envisioning. But finding out that that's what they actually release is kind of is kind of disappointing um, because I don't think it's there. It doesn't look interesting to me. I actually was more interested in some of the stuff they were showing that was like, um, for example, like the, the tech screens and like the diplomacy screens. There's a pretty cool sh um, shot of like what spying looks like. Which is all very Dune, you know. Yeah. Um, At least so it I, seems it seems like they've absorbed the lore of the franchise properly. Mm -hmm. Like I could imagine playing a Dune adventure game or a Dune strategy game, but sure. I would not imagine playing like a Dune action game. Uh, That'd be really uh, weird. And Forex is kind of a tough spot for Dune as well. I mean, I know there's you know planets and worlds and stuff like that, but it's all pretty lifeless, you know. Like yeah. Dune doesn't Dune doesn't have like those kind of planets that pop out to me. Like some other, you know, properties have where it's like, oh, wow, look at this beautiful, gorge, you know, uh, gorgeous, lush jungle or something. It's all very, okay, well, here's variations of sand. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, um, like the problem with Dune is that if you leave Arrakis, where do you go in terms right. of a strategy game, right? I guess you could do a prequel and set it during the Butler and Jihad, but like <laughs> there's not much else you can really do with the whole premise. Yeah, and and it feels like this the struggle there is to incorporate a, how do you make that a four X then um, you know because yeah it, it, you know the, you've got these different houses struggling and, and all that and that that's all cool but Dune always felt like kind of like a small scale you know I, mean, I don't I don't know if there's any like pitched battles and open warfare in Dune it kind of always felt like betrayals and backstabs and, and yeah. things like that. Um, so, you know, when you're seeing these units kind of clash, the way they're kind of looking at doing it is, OK, well, this represents a, an infantry force and, you know, it's fighting a mech force. and They've got these little flying things. And I, I don't it's know. It's not I mean, how Dune works, right? Right. This right. is like, you know, Carino and Atreides and Harkonnen can't all be in open warfare on Arrakis. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, it's ripping the planet apart. And I, I think they showed like... Um, uh, like one of the worms as kind of being like a super weapon almost, you know, like it pops out of the ground and eats a couple of the soldiers. I'm like, oh, oh no, you can't please, control the no. worm. Man. Yeah, I, I hope no, no, not. no, like only the Fremen can control the worms. Yeah. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so um, I don't know. Cautiously pessimistic. Let's 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 put, point it up there. I mean, forex is a tough genre to nail. It really yeah. is. When I heard forex, I was very optimistic, but then I assumed that the RTS part of it wouldn't be in the same timeline. Um, getting that right is is, is tough. I don't know of sure. any games who have managed it honestly. Um, you know, a, a real time forex is. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe not Stellaris. What was the Sins of a Solar Empire? I think they tried it. Yeah. Um, to kind of mix results. So yeah, it, it's tough. For sure. And one last set of announcements that happened actually this morning yep. was Pokemon Presents. There is there are two pieces yep. of news here. Uh, well, there are actually more than two pieces of news, but two really important pieces of news. One. Alola's coming to Pokemon Go, so if you want your weird-ass-looking executors, those are finally going to be Pokemon Go. Your, your weird, like, like male harem lizards, your dominatrix berries, we're getting them. Awesome. All the good ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and I actually, while I don't play Pokemon Go, and I have never except for, like, one minute or so, um, I do really love the Pokemon of the seventh generation. They're just very bright and energetic and weird. So it's nice that they're kind of getting to be on that stage. I mean, if I'm being honest, I pretty much will like any generation of Pokemon because you throw in 70 to 100 characters. A bunch of them are probably going to end up being good. Yeah. Ghost so. Q-Elms, man. It's all there. I love yeah. it. Um, and the big announcement is you thought that one Pokemon game this year was enough. No, no, no. We're getting two more. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet were announced. Yeah. Uh, they they are going to complain about those ones, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> they are, um, this is the ninth generation. It's uh, Typically, Pokemon jumps up to a generation every two to somewhere between two to four years. Three is usually the standard. And that's when they add a bunch of new casts, a new region, and some small iterations. In this case, we are in an unnamed region that appears to be based heavily on Spain, possibly Portugal. Um, your starters include um, a grass cat, a fire crocodile, and a water duck that I am very, I am slightly convinced will grow up to look like a pirate. <laughs> I, it's a missed opportunity to call that thing Pompa Duck, right? <laughs> His starter form looked like he's wearing a Mario hat. That's like yeah, the only thing I noticed. That's, that's what I think. It's like a it's like a seaman hat, and it's gonna yeah. turn into like a captain's hat. Um, but uh, the it's very exciting, partially because this is um they've announced that this is going to be the their first attempt at a truly open world. So in, in basically the past like half decade or so. The, um, Game Freak has been inching, inching more towards exploring this idea in Pokemon Sword and Shield. They had a large sandbox area, the wild area, and then added two more in the DLC. And in Pokemon Legends, it's set in these giant sandboxes. And But now this is apparently a single contiguous, a large, apparently is primarily a large single continuous world where you don't just have to like load in, go into the exit and then go to the city you can just sort of naturally go in and out of any area i think that's the direction they really do need to go in with this franchise that's always where i'd imagined it would go when i was a kid so it feels like they're finally making good on that to me legends arceus seemed like a proof of concept more than anything like yeah we I, can build I, this I know... world. sorry go ahead i was gonna say that like i've heard that description before i'm not a huge fan of it because like legends is a fairly giant game it has a lot of stuff and it yeah. feels like it does feel kind of weird to treat it as that as like this sort of just like small like tossed aside thing i don't mean it like oh, it's yeah. smaller tossed aside i mean that it was purposely designed for them to experiment with some ideas yes, that they hadn't experimented with before i think that's fair the um like the game is really weird and i would be talking about it that when we talk about what we're playing if i didn't have other stuff to talk about um in fact let's move on to wait no we have something else to talk about before we get there um and i don't want to spend too much time on this but let's get right into it uh a lot of acquisitions have been happening in the industry lately uh, 
former Bioware developer Aaron Flynn's studio, Inflection Games, just got bought by Tencent. And there's been one other really big acquisition that we have to talk about, which is Nintendo's decision to purchase systems research and development. Who saw that that one? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) How were they not owned by them already? I I I mean, they're working with them for 40 years. They work in the same damn building. I found found the news very weird also. I was always running like, isn't that a part or already like a semi part of Nintendo already? Uh, It's... I, it's also, I think, worth pointing out that like Nintendo has a lot of relationships with companies like this. Um, the HAL Laboratory, who makes Kirby, Intelligent Systems, who makes Fire Emblem, Paper Mario, they are completely independent. Um, technically, like the stuff they own, I believe, is not owned by Nintendo at all. So you can count them as officially like third parties. They're just so tightly connected that there may as well not be. Um, yeah, like that's. Game Freak has actually released games for yep. other platforms. Yes, surprisingly. Game, Game Freak is an independent company. It's just that the Pokemon license is shared between them, Nintendo, the Pokemon Company, and Creatures Incorporated. Yeah, that is a lot of fingers and a lot of pies, or a lot of fingers yeah. in the same pie, I should say. And if you are wondering why, say, like the Pokemon characters get to go to Smash Brothers but don't get to go to Mario Kart. That's pr- basically most likely why. There you go. Uh-huh. Uh, but jokes aside, the biggest acquisition that happened in the past few weeks was Sony's acquisition of Bungie. Yeah. Yeah, it's Sorry. it's a weird one. I, I don't know think what to think pers- of this at all. I think firstly, it's just them um, like, uh, yeah, Xbox is like buying a lot of big things. Uh, Let's also buy like a big studio to keep like some exclusives to us. Well, but... so that's the thing. Um, I've been following a lot of this, obviously a huge Destiny fan, but mm-hmm. weirdly, there's no guarantees at all in any of the contract language about exclusives. Nothing. That is weird. Yeah. It's very so weird. What a, they, a lawyer basically went through the whole acquisition and he said that his vibe on this isn't that Sony is buying Destiny for their games. They're buying them for two reasons. One, for their IP. Um, they see Destiny as a potential jumping off point for cartoons, comics, movies, stuff like that. Um, so that's Kind of like what Riot did with League of Legends? Yes, exactly. And also, it's worth pointing out that Sony, unlike Microsoft or Nintendo, is a company that has a much stronger arm in the entertainment industry. Right. Yes, of course, they're still making new Spider-Mans and stuff like that. Yeah, so that's that's what he thinks is number one thing. The number two thing is, is he says that Bungie has tons of experience making arguably one of the few games as a service that's stuck around, right? I mean, we're in, you know lots of seasons and lots of years of destiny and they've made it work for whatever reason sony really 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 wants to get into that space um so much so that i think they've announced that they're going to have 10 uh live service games by the end of 23 that's a lot of live service games and i think what the insinuation is that they're buying bungie for the experience or you know like the live service expertise. Like yes, they're, exactly. um, in a way, it would be, I guess, kind of analogous to Monolith, Nintendo buying Monolith Soft, except that when they did, Monolith Soft didn't have any of that expertise. They only right. built it after they built Xenoblade. Yeah. And and Bungie has no problem getting out for deals that don't work for them. They've done it with Apple. They've done it with Microsoft. They've done it with Activision. They'll do it with Sony if they need to. Um, so I expect that the contract's written very similar to the way their Activision one, Um, you know, hey, if we buy ourselves out, we buy ourselves out. You guys are going to have to deal with it. I could see that being part of the language, Um, but Bungie has been adamant. You're going to play Destiny wherever you want to play Destiny. If anything, we might add it to more services rather than less. Um, So I think that's a good sign for fans of the series. And as someone who plays a ton of Destiny, I can tell you that if you cut out PC and Xbox, this game's dead. It's not it doesn't have that base population. It's like any MMO where you need to have a certain critical mass of numbers for the game to work. And if you cut out two thirds of your player base, I would actually probably 
if I had to guess, I don't know what the actual numbers look like, but I would guess around two thirds. I think less on Xbox, more on PC. But if you cut out that player base, the game dies. You don't get matchmaking. You don't find people to do things with. It just it, it you know, even right now, they're having difficulty getting PS5 and PS4 players together just because the systems are so vastly difficult. If you switch the game to be PS5 only, forget it. It doesn't have the user base to play, you know, that style of game. So I don't think destiny is going anywhere anytime soon on systems but yeah i, I think what you're going to see is you're going to start hearing rumors and announcements about tv shows uh animes I, I think the league of legends play is really what's in effect here uh on top of hey we're going to bring some of the you know execs over i mean they even get their own seat on the board that's insane for uh, a studio to negotiate um yeah. you know something like that is, is wild so Everybody's saying Bungie made a great deal. They kind of had Sony in a spot where Sony needed the announcement almost more than they needed the studio. Bungie um, let them have that opportunity. And uh, I mean, this was also a deal that was taking that would ta- have taken months pl- like mm-hmm. place. Obviously, the announcement was the way the announcement was feels very strongly, you know, inspired by Microsoft's mm-hmm. acquisition deal. But like yeah, the it, ac- the actual acquisition was probably months in the making. And if, I believe the talk started before the talks for Microsoft's acquisition of Activision. The the Activision acquisition was like very quickly, like very slapdash and last minute. Um, if the if they did, if it was inspired by Microsoft, it was probably just by Microsoft buying Bethesda. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And I, I do think it's notable that like when they got purchased, Bungie specific, very specifically, like said in no uncertain terms that they're not going to that they will be making multi-platform games yeah it's a because when the bethesda was bought up like it was very clearly like they didn't explicitly say it but it was very clear that they're like we're going to really aggressively prioritize xbox at least yeah and we'll probably have most of these be exclusives except for game pass basically while um Bungie was wasn't doing that, and mm-hmm. the Activision they and Microsoft's also kind of like backpedaled on Activision because clearly they are they don't want to be seen as too much of a monopoly because otherwise the the deal won't go through. Yeah, for sure. Uh, All right, let us move on to talking about what we've been playing lately. Um. So, Brasson, what have you been playing lately? I've been playing a bunch of stuff, mostly a bit indie games and stuff. I've played unpacking. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, I, that game. I <laughs> kind of wanted to talk about Earthbound, but yeah, I kind of wanted to talk more about unpacking. I finished it just uh, yesterday. It's very short for a 20 euros game, I think. It's like at most two hours, but it's it's very effective at what it does. Yeah. It's really it has like a really fun mechanic to it, but it also really really plays well on a psychological level, I think, because it gives like nearly no uh, story beats away in text and stuff like that. You just like making connections with your mind pretty much to what is going on and why you're unpacking a new house again. It's... Yeah, it does a, a really good job of telling the story through, like the actual gameplay of of putting objects in their place. It's really the objects that you move around that tell the story. Yeah, it's not not even that. It's like also your mind is just making like endless assumptions. Like, yeah, um, you move back home. Oh, yeah, you're relationship uh, broke up and of course you will find a picture for back you can hang it off on like the board but there will be a pin through the ex-boyfriend's face <laughs> or you can hide it in the closet that's like the only two options where it goes now oh yeah, yeah. like actually the game won't let you progress if you pin it to the corkboard you have to hide it away <laughs> yes um, which i thought was a really powerful storytelling moment yep so yeah really interesting game that uh Received a lot of plaudits last year. Yeah, I mean, I'm not one of those people. But, yeah, I know. I think it was on your like worst though, right? Yeah, but we, <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. It, it was like a very well received game. So, 
Um, yeah, why yeah, why didn't I, you really like it, Murph? It's weak. Uh, I don't want to like rag on a game that you you enjoyed. So. I, I enjoyed it, but I didn't like love it. Like I said, it's way too short for the price it is, is at now. Oh, what platform did you play it on? I played it on Switch. Oh yeah, I also played it on Switch, and I think that's what pissed me off about it. Um, because I tried to use the touchscreen controls, and they're really bad. Oh no 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 no. <laughs> Yeah. No, I I use I use my pro uh, pro controller even, which was the way to go to play. Oh it, yeah, honestly. I played it handheld with the touch screen oh, and no. the stylus, and it was a <laughs> no. Nightmare. It's it's way way too much. Yeah, way too janky. I played like on my TV with like the pro, which is like one of the few times in years I played like the switch, not not uh, yeah, not in handheld mode. Yeah, I use it mostly handheld because like the only place I have it hooked up to a TV is. Uh, like in my basement next to an exercise bike. So like if I'm <laughs> playing the, the Switch on a TV, I'm exercising at the same time. Uh, so like, you know, there's, I, I'm very rarely playing it outside of handheld mode. But yeah, I'm glad that you, you found something you enjoyed in it. Uh, Kappa, what have you been playing lately? I've been playing, well, the one I want to talk about, I've played a lot of stuff, but uh, Warhammer 3 Total War, I usually just call it Total Warhammer 3, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, it's Total Warhammer. I don't yeah. know why they didn't just call it <laughs> yeah. that. I don't know either. It's uh, it's right there. Um, it has finally really, really taken, like, if you take the four or five most recent releases they've had, they've all had very, like, slight changes and iterative changes and stuff. And it's like they're all finally here for Warhammer. Uh, very, very, very cool campaign. I'm chomp through most of it kind of some pros and cons with the different factions a lot of them i'm sure will get ironed out but um warhammer or you know feels like just the perfect property for total war total war feels like it's really running with it it knows what to do with it it likes messing around with the different fantasy elements um and things like that uh you can really tell I mean, like, this is just, just my guess, but they really love making some of these, like, crazy, gross units, ogres that fart on each other, and, you know, like... Like, is it kind what, of comedic, almost? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, you know, there's there's also, like, this kind of, like, sexy demon faction, and, like, their, like, world events are really funny and gross. Someone posted one, and it was, like, you find, a like, a writhing hole in the ground, what do you do with it? And, like, one of them's basically, like do the grossest thing you could think of if you found a writhing hole on the ground, you know? Um, and yep, like, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of that. Um, and you, you, I wasn't really expecting that, um, you know, for the game to kind of get a little more fun, a little more goofy with it. Um, but the Chaos Factions, I think if you really think about it, they're a little too edgy to do super serious all the time. Um, so the two or three they added that aren't corn. Um k-h-o-r-n-e not you know the band or the the food um i think that's allowed them to be a little bit more fun and goofy with it um and that's maybe taken some of the the pressure off of the seriousness of it um the two human factions you can play kislev and kathay both play amazing have really cool um elements to their their gameplay um i've beaten it twice with kislev and kathay gonna try a chaos walkthrough or chaos playthrough once things kind of quiet down on other games but uh yeah really 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 enjoy it um it's it's on game pass I, I don't know how that deal worked out but uh fantastic game you can check out for like a buck if, if you want to yeah it's uh it's neat that this that like this sub series has done so well for total because mm -hmm. that's been a series with a lot of ups and downs over the years yeah it's 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 hard to stick it i think into every kind of like, what's the difference between, you know, the War of the Roses and the Battle of Hastings? Like, not a lot, right? Like, so you can't, you, you put it in the same game. Like, they started to get to the point where, like, Napoleon, I think, was kind of their last historical line of it. And then they went back and started doing, like, Rome 2 and, and stuff like that. But I feel like once they got to gunpowder, the game really started to kind of fall apart in the historical stuff. It just didn't feel right anymore. Um, yeah. So I, th I think that's why you get the fantasy stuff. You get kind of um, the the mythological based one with uh, Troy, and then you get the Three Kingdoms one that also has kind of a, a mythological mode, if you want to talk about it that way, versus like the more serious, um, you know, kind of historical mode. Yeah, so it's it's been through like 
all these all these ups and downs and, and it's been through all these historical periods i i almost wonder if like because they kind of have a little bit more control about how they portray things in a fantasy setting, whether that mm-hmm. works to their advantage. I, I think so. And I think we've joked about it a couple of times, but I don't know what the license looks like for a Warhammer game. Cause it seems like anybody with a computer can go get one. Right. So like I, there's like 15 Warhammer games released every year, but it seems like they do give a crap about what the units look like, how they play. Are they being true to the lore? I I'm not as into the Warhammer universe as anybody else, but um, going back and reading some of the stuff I think has been interesting and in saying, Oh, okay, well this is why this unit or this, this uh, you know, faction acts this way. It gives them more of a background. Um, yeah. And so that that's the kind of part that I've enjoyed. Like if you're talking about lore, or getting into like what they are about. But I mean, everybody gets what a big giant raging fire demon is about. You don't really need you know too much backstory there. But um, they actually have an honest campaign now that isn't just go conquer a bunch of cities. Um, and I think that's a really cool effort. I think it's fed into a little bit by what happened in Troy, um, th- that style of play, and a little bit of Three Kingdoms. Um, so I, I think that's going to be the one thing that maybe, you know, if, if it hasn't gotten in, hooks into you yet, if someone says, well, you can actually play a story in this one now, um, I think there's a chance that might grab a few more people than the, the rest of Total War usually does. Oh, that's interesting. And as someone who owns Troy, uh, because mm-hmm. they gave it away it's for free, free at yeah. release, <laughs> which is absolutely nuts to me, um, yeah. maybe I, I'll go check that out. Oh, Wolfman, what have you been playing? Um, I will try to keep this short. And Rachel, like, I actually just started playing Elden Ring. It's it's very fun. I would normally want to talk about it in Pokemon Legends Arceus, which I actually only finished last week. They're both very fun games. I like them a lot, and I think it's interesting to see how they actually kind of explore uncomfortably similar, like, ma- like subject matter. Huh. Um, not this. Is, I mean, that's a little bit uh, overplaying it. Uh, Pokemon is basically about immigrating to a new land where it's very, ho- where the nature is very hostile, and you and the local populations are trying to like kind of understand this land in a way that's like that's very threatening and uh, disquieting. But if you get to know it, it's safer. And then Elden Ring is basically about living in like every Dark Souls game. It's about living in a dying and like dead land where that used to be this place of beauty and now it's a little bit more in pain, but it's okay. Cause you know, you can get something out of it. Um, but no, I, I, I feel like I need to talk about kingdom hearts too, because I'm <laughs> near the end. Um, this will be my, uh, when I start after, uh, this will be my fourth week playing it. Um, I'm, I, uh, I actually started this only since the beginning of the year like literally since the beginning of January, I've made it my goal to play through, if not exclusively the entirety of it, at least the majority of the mainline Kingdom Hearts series. Um, In January, it took me about all of January to get through Kingdom Hearts 1. I spent a week watching Chain of Memories because I couldn't really get to the play style. Now I'm I, to... I actually gave up midway through Chain of Memories and watched the rest on YouTube because I couldn't <laughs> deal with the combat uh, after a while. I, I'm going to say that I I assume it was a lot nicer when it was a GBA game and not like yeah. just a weird like mishmash of mechanics from a GBA card battle game and your pre-existing action RPG game. Uh, but uh, two is... It's interesting to me, like when I came on the last, I don't know if it was the last time I was on here, it's been a while, but you know, the, one of the times I was on here, we had a lot of fun making fun of Kingdom Hearts. We do that a bit on this show Yeah. because it's, if we're going to be honest, uh, it's a very easy show to make fun of. And I say this as someone who does like Kingdom Hearts 2 and to a lesser extent Kingdom Hearts 1 now, but wow, it, this is a bizarre series. Um <laughs> Like, I don't I, know how it got made. <laughs> I um I've basically been part of the reason for this like decision, this project is that every Sunday, including we're recording on a Sunday, um re- every Sunday releasing a diary of all of the stuff of Kingdom Hearts I've played of the week. And you know, a lot of it is me finding stuff that I like and finding stuff that's interesting to talk about, but like 
there's never a week where it hasn't just been exceedingly weird in some capacity. And sometimes that's actually fun and good. And sometimes it's just kind of overbearing. Uh, in the case of um, Kingdom Hearts 2, it has great stuff. It has a fun combat system. And if depending on which Disney movie you get to go watch at, by playing the game, you get some characters who are absolutely excellent. And then you have some who are Tron from Tron who aren't. Um, and, but it's all like, it's, that alone is just super weird the way it's structured, like the way that you're kind of going in and interacting with these movies that they don't interact with each other. They just mm. interact with you. And then, but then it's like mixed with this bizarre, increasingly labyrinthine plot about like, about a clandestine conspiracy of people in black robes who want to do something and they're not really... I'm not sure if they actually have explained what it is and I don't understand it or if they're still holding off. I think it's a little bit of both. It's mostly the former. They yeah. explain the big plan without spoiling anything. They explain the big plan in Dream Drop Distance. Okay, got it. So it's going to be a while. Um, Kingdom of Hearts 2 is interesting because actually the Kingdom of Hearts game with the most kind of interaction between Disney worlds. Um, in Kingdom Hearts 3 and in the spin-offs like Birth by Sleep and Dream Drop Distance, it's very, very siloed. Yeah. So Kingdom it, Hearts 2 is actually unique in that regard. It's really a shame because like some partially because it's a crossover, part of the appeal is seeing the characters interact, and partially because there are characters in the game, uh most prompt for me, they by far it's Jack Skellington from the Nightmare Before Christmas, who is the best, who I think is the best character in the series. And, like, he elevates literally everything, every scene he's in, every character he's with. And But then you have characters like their version of Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean, who I'm very glad it's not being played by Johnny, Johnny Depp, Depp yeah. for many reasons. Um, the unfortunate side effect is that he is incredibly sedate and just very, very, like, somnambulant as a performance. <laughs> He doesn't have any personality. It's very, no. very... Uh, it's Jack Sparrow with all the edges sanded off. Which is, to be fair, Jack Sparrow from, like, Pirates 2 onward. Uh, I've only seen the first Pirates. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, no. Run the that series. That's probably for the best. Yeah, but, um... But, yeah, it's very odd to me. Like, it's not just, okay, a Disney Final Fantasy crossover. Like, when I say that to people who don't play games and when they're asking me what I'm playing... It's like that alone is kind of weird. Like that they and they're able to accept that is super weird and that's it. But it's so hard to actually like go really further in and just be like, no, it's you really don't understand how just nuts this is and how nonsensical it is. <laughs> and why is the main character putting his fingers in the mouth of his best friend to check that it's his best friend? <laughs> and, and why I had forgotten heroes, about that. And why is the hero's, like, weird shadow self skateboarding around town to s deliver mail to pigeons? <laughs> I mean, These questions and more. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's just what Roxas does. You, know, uh, it, you can't really so, question it. You just got to roll with it. Yeah, I, I'm not going to keep belaboring this because I know we're trying to be a little bit more time sensitive here. But... Uh, like, basically, this is where I'm kind of at, where it's Kingdom Hearts 2 is a game that, for the most part, I really like. A few nonsensical and really bad gameplay and story decisions aside, but more to the point, it's just so weird. It's captivating in its weirdness, but I still do, it's still, like, hard for me to fully understand why it became so big, because I don't think it can be just, like, stated as the Disney properties, because the treatment of the Disney properties is so slapdash. Yeah, what I... It's one of those things that I'm almost intellectually interested in more than I actually enjoy. Yeah. Um, in the sense that I'm just compelled by what's going on. I don't know if I even like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't even know if I actually like Kingdom Hearts. I just want to see what happens you want next. To go where yeah, it's the same yeah. for We're just, me, though. You know, I'm just waiting for, you know, them Kingdom Hearts 4 to add Mabel Pines and Dr. Facilier from <laughs> Princess and the Frog. Oh, I, I just want them to dig into the vault and bring up the weirdest properties. They've actually done some pretty obscure things. Like, they do 
I'll spoil this. They do Three Musketeers in yeah. oh, I uh, know. <laughs> Dream Drop Distance, and that was a direct-to-DVD movie. So yeah, they're but willing it's, but it's to do very, some weird stuff. Yeah, um, but it's a very beloved one still. Yeah, they should do... You know what they should do that they haven't done? Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Like, that's ripe for me. Um, yeah, I'm sure. actually going to go and say The Three Caliberos. I think they should do The Avengers. Now, I, I, I think it's... <laughs> I, I feel like that, like, gets kind of aside from what, like, a bigger part of what's fun about, like, the core Disney stuff. Yeah. For the same reason I don't really think Star Wars would be, would add anything. I really hope they don't add Star Wars. I, I, I want to like, see their takes on it. I, I don't care. <laughs> if you've ever thought that the Rise of Skywalker had stilted acting and re- <laughs> re- creative choices, just wait till you fight a light Keyblade saber sword. <laughs> um, oh, a Keyblade but, of light? Yeah. Wait, isn't oh, that just what so, Kyrie wields? I don't even know anymore. Yeah, um, so... That's my take on Kingdom Hearts 2. It's exceptionally weird, more so than I really expected going in, where I'm like, okay, I know a lot about the plot. I know that there's people who come out of people who turn into monsters, and some of those people form an evil conspiracy to reshape the world, and, you know, Mickey Mouse is the king for some reason, even though I feel like that kind of gets away from Mickey's regular Joe personality. But whatever, Mario had a castle in one game, so let's... Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Um... But yeah, it's it's incredibly, incredibly odd. And sometimes, a lot of time, for the most part, in Kingdom Hearts 2, it uses that oddness really well. Um, uh, with each like entry, basically, though, that I write of this diary, literally, like, every single one, every other one is just like, I really hate this, I'm really just struggling with this. No, no, next week, I really like it. And <laughs> even, like, within them, each single entry, each single day I'm writing, I'm just like, Wow, my opinions on the series are just moving so widely. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff in that game and that series that I originally thought was terrible or stupid or corny but that I then came to appreciate, especially later in the series when it gets kind of self aware. Um, by the time you reach Kingdom Hearts 3, they're just cracking meta jokes all over the place. So oh, it gets weird. Uh, um, I. The one last thing I'm going to say on this, and then I will stop. Um, Goofy's fake death is bullshit. <laughs> um, and the, so in Kingdom Hearts 2, midway through, there's a part where Goofy sees Mickey Mouse about to be attacked by a rock, and he pushes Mickey out of the way, and then he gets hit by the rock, and he slams headfirst into a wall, and everyone's sad that he's died, and Mickey throws off his cloak to show you that, yeah, Mickey Mouse is a badass, and he means business. He's a one-man wrecking crew who also knows how to party. And then literally the next scene where the hero is in, Goofy suddenly comes back as though nothing had happened. Mm. Um, the original plan was apparently that they actually did intend for uh, Goofy to die and be replaced by Max, his son from Goof Troop. That would have been That's hilarious. That's even the worst idea, to be honest. I, I kind of like it, but... Um, it, it, it oh, they whipped out. Yeah, um, and apparently Disney was very adamant, you can't fucking kill Goofy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's like one of the few things I really know about Kingdom Hearts is like the fake Goofy death, and that's like internet awesome. meme legend at this point, pretty much. All right. Um, yeah, so please, Merv. <laughs> one thing I wanted to talk about this week was a game that came out last year by White Owls, Swery's studio, called The Good Life. Uh, Ironically, given the name, it's not very good. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, so the premise here is that you arrive at an old English town that is supposed to be the happiest place on Earth, but there's been some mysterious rumblings there that you are tasked with investigating in order to get out of debt, because I guess you gambled or drank a lot? I'm not really sure. So it's an adaptation of Cuphead. (laughs) <laughs> pretty much it's cuphead but really badly animated so mm. yeah so it's an open world game almost in the style of shenmue ish um and you complete various tasks fetch quests errands photography quests in order to progress the story 
The twist is that you can transform into a cat or dog at will, and cats and dogs have various abilities that humans don't have, like the ability to run fast or jump high or smell things. Or attack mice. <laughs> so basically, it's kind of like how Elden Ring gives you a horse that can double jump. Yeah, <laughs> except terrible. <laughs> it's not good. Uh, it's very, very janky. As you would uh, expect from a swearing. Swear. Yeah, <laughs> I think I, I, I got I caught on there, yeah. Yeah, the, the problem is I'm playing it on PC, and the problem with playing it on PC is that... Um, Moving around with a controller would be really awkward because the camera is really optimized for a mouse, mm. but all the controls are severely meant to be used with a controller. Like, for instance, uh, jumping and exiting out of menus is mapped to the right mouse button, and you can't change this, and Ooh, you can't separate is... them because I guess it's supposed to be yeah. like a B button. That's a deal breaker right there. I, I so can weird. never play. Do that. you um, do you think that like you mentioned it like kind of is meant to run on a PC esque system where you know you have that kind of more direct camera control? Like, do you think how do you think this necessarily like plays on consoles? Uh, probably not well. Um, mm -hmm. like the thing is, all the what's really weird, and I can't speak to the console versions. What's really weird about the PC version is that it seems like moving around and um, especially looking at anything or moving the camera around is very optimized for mouse and literally everything else is optimized for um, a controller. Okay. So, You've had so much bad luck lately with games that don't control well, I feel like. <laughs> this is like four or five in a row now. It's just you getting beat yeah. up by the, the control of the game. I did mean, it, I just haven't been too, talking uh... about the games that control yeah. well. Like, yeah. I completed Halo Infinite recently. I controlled yeah. like a dream. Yeah. Um, there you go. yeah. But didn't like... you play Bellin also? Like a Bellin well, Wonderland. I played the demo. <laughs> God, I, that convinced me not lot. to get the whole thing because uh, the uh, demo is I'm... horrifying. Uh, I, I'm going to be playing Bellin this year. <laughs> for, for it's for research. It's for an article. Is there any like, way you can get out of writing this article so you don't have to play well, Bellin? Well, the thing is, there is, the problem is that I have one editor who is very demanding, and his name is Wolfman Jew. <laughs> okay, I made yeah. a promise to myself to play through this, just as I promised to play through Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep three times. You Wait, why do you have to play three times? I thought that the, the each character, because it's got three characters, and I thought... Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So it has three separate campaigns, but they're all fairly short. And then okay. it unlocks a final thing once you've beaten all campaigns. So it's you're meant to you're not really playing it thrice. In fact, yeah. there are locations you go in some routes that you don't see in others. Oh, perfect! That's excellent. Yeah. Um, so don't worry, you're not playing the same game thrice. Uh, but um, I actually did have one other question though about the good life. Yeah. Which is that um you um. You and Kappa mentioned Swery65, the guy who directed this. Um, he's someone I've only I've been he's been on I think some of our radars for me. It was Deadly Premonition, which is a game I do really love. Um, both in spite of and because of its jankiness. Um, where like do you think to what extent do you think this is like, and maybe I'm overthinking this, but do you think like how this necessarily feels as something that is following up or reacting to his later works. Cause deadly premonition two came out very recently, even before the good life. And it was not well received, to, mm -hmm. you know, to say the least. I uh, feel like it's, I don't think this is a reaction to anything. It feels okay. very much like its own game and a game that swear had always wanted to make. Yeah, I think that's every sweary game, at least for me. I don't think he's very compromising. I think he's maybe, you know, the equivalent of like an auteur. And this is the game he's going to make. And this is actually just his style. This, this is who he is. And you're kind of with it or not. But th the technical aspects of the game are always so tough. And I think, I think this might sound kind of weird. I almost think it's by design. I think he wants to challenge you. A lot of the, you know, artists and directors and well, stuff talk about stuff like that. Hey, I'm... I, 
I'm not going to make this easy. You're not going to love this. This isn't. And uh, I think that's a very honestly kind of admirable way to look at games. Like this is something I used to love about Suda five mm-hmm. one, and I think he kind of like drained a lot out of that. And the, ever the since pro- the success of the first No More Heroes, like actively kind of trying to challenge you as a player, I think that's really interesting and neat. I think the um, problem though with that versus a movie is I can sit down and force myself through pretty much any, you know, 90 minute movie. But when you're asking me to do play a game, that's kind of bad, maybe a little even on purpose for, you know, 20 hours. No, I'm not, I can't, I can't do it. Well, I it's mean, just... like, I don't know if the good life is meant to be a 20 hour game. It's supposed to be around 12 to 15 hours. So okay, it is that's pretty actually... long. Yeah. yeah. And it's not like, See, things like even moving around can be really janky in this game. Mm-hmm. And I'm comparing this to their 2D game, The Missing. And as buggy as that game could be, the basic act of moving around in that space was very polished. And so I just wonder if they didn't have the resources to pull this off properly or just didn't prioritize making it feel good to play. It Maybe the art style was the focus. Yeah, I or the storytelling. I mean, it that you'd think I thought there'd be a lot more storytelling, but I've gone like half my playtime now. I, I I haven't seen a cutscene. Yeah, Dark Dreams Don't Die kind of had a little bit of that going on too at times. It felt like there was stretches of game, stretches of story. Um, it, it's tough with him. I, I I guess I would rather like think better than worse. You know, and say okay, this. Is it he is doing it on purpose or he doesn't know what he's doing? It's hard to figure well, that out, right? I think right? he's doing this on purpose. I just don't yeah, think he's making good gameplay decisions. Oh. Like, if I could just mention two things. Um, first of all, this game has survival mechanics. Mm-hmm. Like, you have to watch your hunger and your tiredness. And, like, you're, you have a health meter that doesn't recharge and you have to go specifically heal. You can get sick and then have to go to the, you don't go to the doctor, you go to the veterinarian, which is <laughs> hilarious in this game. Um, uh, and then, I... the, sorry, the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, it also, like, it's all based around fetch quests. You're not really doing anything meaningful here. And not only is it based around fetch quests, it's they're aware they're based around fetch quests. So, like, Every time you get a fetch quest, there's a meta joke about, oh, this is just like this RPGs where I have to do teenage okay, fetch yeah. quests. That, that's oh, bullshit. God. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it's so it's really just Shamu, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. Sorry, you were saying something? Oh, I was just saying that's bullshit. Like, don't yeah. do... Meta jokes, I'm not going to say there aren't any that are good. There are some that are good, but they're really hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, ironically, but... Kingdom Hearts is one of the few franchises that successfully pulls them off. Um, I will uh, say also one thing is that it doesn't always have to just be that it's his decision versus it's a larger scenario. Because, like, Deadly Premonition, very kind of famously, the only reason it had combat at all, which is, I think, universally considered the worst aspect of the game, was specifically because there was an executive demand to add combat because otherwise they couldn't sell a game overseas. Oh, yeah, yeah it's... it's Oh, God, I, I replayed it last year, and it's still actively, like, the worst thing ever. Yes. Yeah, it's just shooting it... juggalos. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, Which is not a thing you should do in real life. So. No, no it's, not something you should, it's not something you should do in real life, and it's also not something that leads to satisfying narrative choices. Yeah, yeah. Um, those weird dream sequences. See, I never was able to complete Deadly Premonition because the PC port is in such shambles that it kept crashing during one of them, so I eventually had to give up. I'm sorry, Sweary. I didn't complete your game. Um, so, moving on to the last thing we wanted to talk about today. Well, not exactly talk. We're actually going to play something. We're going to do a oh. trivia challenge. We haven't done in oh, a no. very long time. So, I guess I'm just going to keep score and see who answers the most of these correctly. Uh, so, the way this is going to work is you're just going to yell out the answer. And if two of you yell at the answer at the same time, I'll just give it to one of you at random. So, you know, we can't do this Jeopardy style. I was thinking of like having you type in chat, like, oh boy, know, like, put an no. emoji, but that would, no, that's just going to be too slow. So we're going to do this the old fashioned way, which is yelling. 
Um, <laughs> okay. This is 20 questions. Okay. Let's start with the first one. What is the name of the Vancouver British Columbia studio that currently develops the Gears Next of War? Next level games. Nope. That currently oh. develops the Gears of War franchise. Oh, man. Volition? Nope. That's a different studio. Uh -huh. Oh, wait. I know this. The Coalition? Yes. Ah, I, I, I Coalition Volition. I was close. Yeah, Vo <laughs> Volition is the, are the folks who make uh, Saints Row and Agents of Mayhem. Yes. I was close. All right. Question number two. What is the name of the little gray alien whom Joanna Dark rescues in Perfect Dark and who later assists her on missions? Oh, man. I have no idea. Y'all have played Perfect Dark, right? Is yes. it, no. Isn't it Elvis? Yes, it is Elvis. <laughs> That's damage, one for yeah. person. Okay. Question number three. How many attempts do you have to correctly guess a word in Wordle? Oh, seven. Five. Nope. Six? Yep. Okay. <laughs> I knew it. You got I it eventually. Have to play hard, mode pretty much. <laughs> hard mode in hard mode you have to use all previous information. Ah, okay. Yeah. Got that's it. the difference. Okay. Uh this I kinda this we you have to get right. <laughs> um, the soundtrack of Fahrenheit, aka Indigo Prophecy, featured songs by which Canadian post grudge band, including was Santa. It was the Theory of a Dead Man? It was Theory of a Dead Man. <laughs> Thanks, for I did give it away earlier. That's why I said you guys have to get it right. Okay. Which video game hero wears a fuchsia t shirt, blue jeans, and a Green Bay Packers helmet? Oh. Commander Keen? Yes. Okay. So I didn't know it was a Green Bay Packers helmet, no, but it is a Green Bay Packers helmet. That's interesting. Yeah. Big uh, Aaron so Rodgers fan, I guess. <laughs> scores currently are three points for Kappa, two for Brasson. Wolfman Jew has yet to score. That's correct. All right. Question number six. Who voices Cortana? Oh man. I should know this, but I don't. <laughs> is it Jane something? Nope, it is not Jane something. Okay. All right, if no one knows, whoever can Google is the fastest. Oh, man. What can you do with Cortana and Windows? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. Jennifer Lee Taylor. That is her. Yes, it is Jen Taylor. All right. From which video game does the phrase "All your base are belong to us" originate? Zero Wing. That is correct. Of the three legendary bird Pokemon from the original 151, which one comes second in the Pokédex? Zapdos. Yes, because Dose to get it. Yep. Awesome. All right. Pokemon naming was not the mo dub names for Pokemon were not as clever then as they would become. <laughs> I mean, they did go downhill. We got to pit of. So <laughs> let's be real. It's been ups and downs. Yeah. Uh, Kazutaka Kodaka created which psychopop video game franchise featuring a scholastic killing game and a psychopathic teddy bear named Monokuma? I have no idea. God, it's the stuff you like. <laughs> it is oh, stuff. I, I I know I know what it is. So like a, yeah, I'm dis, I'm gonna Disgaea? Dig. Is that one of? No, them? Disgaea is a different franchise. Okay. I've I've played this. I've talked about this on the podcast. Uh, yeah, you talked about it a lot, but I'm all right. Still Google time. Remember it. A psychopathic. <laughs> and <laughs> it's a it's a deck in Europa. Yeah, it is Danganronpa. Ah, man. See, I was close. I knew it started with a D. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. I thought this was about the person who made Danganronpa. Yeah. No, was... no. No, oh, the, I, no, I, I, told, I gave you the like person and asked you which start. franchise. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the clear is Kazutaka Kodaka. <laughs> um, all right. This one you also have to get. Video games based on which sci-fi franchise created by Frank Herbert are said to be seminal games in the real-time strategy Dune, genre. Dune. All right, Brasson answered first. Brasson got it, yeah. All right, so it currently stands 
four for Kappa, four for Brasson, and two for Wolfman Jew. It's still anybody's game. The next 10 questions are here. Uh, which game, developed by Fulbright, is set aboard a space station and involves using an AR Tacoma. device? Yes, was that Wolfman Jew? That was. Yeah, revolve, involves using an AR device to review past conversations. Question number 12. What is the currency in the Legend of Zelda franchise called? Rupee. Rupee. That was Kappa first, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's also the currency it used in India. India, yeah. <laughs> <Kind of weird. laughs> Which, it, like, because, I mean, you know, I'm, my parents are from India, so it's so weird seeing, like, rupees being a thing in Zelda. I'm like, that's my parents' currency. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever ask him if they hide them in pots or anything? <laughs> yeah, I I don't know where they're hiding all the rupees. I'm sure they have some lying somewhere, but like rupees, like uh, it's like something like I don't know ninety Canadian dollars to rupee. I should look this up. Sorry, ninety rupees to Canadian dollar. I should look up what the exchange rate Was is. Was there ever a situation wait, wait, where you went out and your parents were like, "Hey, go cut the grass and I'll give you some rupees," and you were like, "Uh oh." <laughs> uh, one one rupee is uh, no uh, no dot no seventeen Canadian dollar. Wow! So if if you make like two hundred, it's like three uh, thirty eight. That's okay. for two hundred Indian rupees. So it's even lower than you thought. Huh? Okay. Good to know. All right. Number thirteen. Which studio, currently owned by Sony, developed the Sly Cooper franchise, the Infamous franchise, and Ghost of Tsushima? It's in, it's Sucker Punch. Yeah, it was Sucker Punch, not Insomniac. Yeah. That's correct, Brisson. Yes. Uh, Insomniac made uh, what should we call it? Killzone. Uh, no, uh, that was Guerrilla more. Games. Murph, do I get extra points if I can say, like the company that took over uh, Sly Cooper? Uh, it was Sanzaru Games. So yeah, no, Sanzaru, because I knew yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> if you can tell me something new, you get extra points. <laughs> I don't know why I know that it's Sanzaru. Why is that knowledge in my head? I've never played a Sly Cooper game. Yeah, Sly Cooper games are fun, game. you. Yeah. I should. I should play one. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. All right. Number 14. What is the name of the alien world that you visit in the final section of Half-Life? Uh, uh, I have no idea. It's with a Z or an X. Damn it. It's Zen, right? With it is Zen. <laughs> Thanks, Wolfman. No problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, and with that, Brasson moves into the lead. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> Question number 15. What is the name of the protagonist of the Monkey Island franchise? Guy Brush uh, 3. Aye, aye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Kappa. So Kappa said that. Guy Brush Threepwood is correct. All right. Question. I think we've alternated between really easy and really obscure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, question number 16. The first game in the fighting game franchise, Soul Calibur, wasn't called Soul Calibur. Soul Edge. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. It was instead Soul called Soul Edge. Edge or Soul Blade. Soul Edge in Japan, Soul Out Blade in the West. Correct, Wolfman. Uh, next question. Michael Fassbender and Marion Cotillard starred in a 2016 movie based Assassin's on which creed yes that was correct kappa it was assassin's creed i don't know awful. anyone's actually watched the movie <laughs> it was so bad I, it's well, very I was bad a, i was a long-standing they could actually make a good movie of assassin's creed and that movie just destroyed any credibility i would have had about that because oh man it was not good yeah you think if you get actors of that caliber at right. least you get something watchable uh, it's a know. historical it, um, fiction story it's it, if i may though um merv you are saying a good actor can make any project even no matter how badly written good oh i'm not saying that i said because, it can make it watchable because okay because i was gonna say that um king several actors from kingdom hearts uh, <laughs> they need a word <laughs> Yo, okay, do not speak ill of Christopher Lee and Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> uh, I won't. All I'm saying is that <laughs> I genuinely felt bad um, seeing him struggle to explain why Riku had to have needed Ansem's body to control the darkness. Oh, I thought it was amazing coming out of their mouths. <laughs> Any of that nonsense, it's fantastic. It 
it warms my heart to see like great thespians say the most ridiculous <laughs> crap <laughs> but i don't know maybe i just like to watch the world burn <laughs> all right question number 18 gargura amelia watson and kalai p mori are vtubers belonging to which agency agency this is the only vtuber question by the way so you don't have to worry. I'm not going to just, like, ask you VTuber lore is it, questions. Isn't it just, like, Hololive? Hololive. It is Hololive. Uh, I was going to... Good that job. That's the only one I know. So I yeah, it's right the away. same. Yeah, it's... <laughs> the only other one I know is VOMS. So yeah. that's, like... Is it VOMS or VOMS? I don't know. I've just been saying VOMS. Yeah, VOMS <laughs> sounds right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like 90s mall girl. Uh, it's like... <laughs> Oh, yeah. Bombs. I got the bobs. <laughs> um, all right. 19. Waluigi made his first appearance in which video game? Mario Tennis, specifically Nintendo 64. Correct. All right. He this can, is where he's got things... the blanky arms. <laughs> this is where things get interesting. Um, it's currently five points for Wolfman and seven points apiece for Persan and the Kappa. Oh, so whoever answers yeah. this correctly either puts Persona and Kappa into a fight to the death. <laughs> I didn't prepare any tiebreakers, so I'm just going to have to cobble oh, no. off the top of my head. Or one of you will just win it outright. What is the name of the American video game studio that developed and published Among Us? Oh, I have no idea. Um, is it Inner Slot? Yes, right. that's correct. And with that, Brisson wins the trivia challenge. Yay! Yay. <laughs> At, uh, yeah, so eight it points. Close. For, yeah, it was pretty close. Five points yeah, for Wolfman, seven points question, for Kappa, or... eight points for Brisson. This is much closer to the time PT yes. had a runaway and got like yeah. 20 questions <laughs> yeah. right out of 15. I it's, don't know how you get 20 I, 15, I, I knew the Among Us because I was like playing Among Us with my brother earlier this week. That's the only way I know it. I just remember that they had that announcement at E3, and it was like a new ship. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. yeah, it's like an. Yeah, yeah, that's they like... canceled like to follow up, so yeah. they're just like adding to the original. It's pretty wild. Yeah, that's increased the size of the game by thirty three percent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Way to look at it. Yeah, go for go, Intersloth. I I want good things for these folks because they made a game that was initially a flop and then an overnight success i think too it's i think that it's smart to have this game that streamers can play with their fans their audience other streamers just that that type of game i think is there's a there's a niche for it especially when you're seeing stuff like vampire survivor and all that stuff which i talked about a long time ago mm -hmm. now it's starting to really catch on but um i, I think it's... it's smart to have that type of game ready to go it's just Absolutely. the most fun, like, arcade kind of, like, online multiplayer game. It's yeah. very fast, it's fun, it's really easy to play. You can explain it to somebody who doesn't play games in, like, five minutes stops. It's and I, I love fun. I love social games, too, and yeah. Among Us is that one, you know, it's hard to break through with a party game, I think, no matter who you are, short of, you know, maybe Nintendo or Jackbox, but those are all mm -hmm. well-established by now. But uh, I think that was interesting that they were able to break through with like a social party game experiment type thing. Yeah, um, sure. it, it, why it, to your it, friends? <laughs> it makes sense because we also are part of a website that has regular werewolf games. Yeah, I played my first one. Well, second. Yeah, I, I played my I first one also like a couple weeks ago. It was yeah. fun. And like, well, then you're just living the werewolf life. So, I mean, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we've all had experience there. Um, so just to bring this to a close, if you'd like to keep up to date with the podcast, you can follow us on our website at avocadogamescast.wordpress.com, where we post each episode along with a link dump that fact checks most of the stuff we say here. You can also <laughs> subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, or all three if you're weird. Just search for Avocado Gamescast. You'll find us. We're easy to find. And finally, make sure you check out The Avocado, the 
wonderful community that spawned this podcast at the-avocado.org. All right. Thanks for joining me today. This was fun. Yay. Yeah, yeah, that was, a good Yay. <laughs> that for never happens. Good questions and everything. They were of variable quality. We can say <laughs> that. <laughs> That's okay sometimes. I, I won that says like a lot, so yeah. Yeah, you won, so they're very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're got awful. I won, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care, folks. Yep. See you next time. Yeah, take care. Night. See ya.